first version of this video was uh, 20 minutes long and, <laughs> and nobody got time for that. So welcome to 7 Things Take 2. Today we're going to be looking at 7 people or groups of people who did not expect to go out the way that they went out. That's right, we're talking about death. Starting with number 1, King Eglon. Now King Eglon, um, long story short, Moabite king, oppressing Israel, Judges chapter 3, very fat. Now, and it wasn't, you know, cholesterol that got him. It wasn't a heart attack. It was actually Ehud, the left-handed judge of Israel. And why is his left-handedness important? Well, let me show you. It's because of swords. So normally, in a right-hand society, you hold your sword on your left and you pull with your right. And then you have your sword ready to chop, stab, etc. However, because Ehud is left-handed, he's going to have it on his right side, and he's actually going to pull with his left. And see, that's important because that makes him a prime candidate to get through the inspection, because they're not checking his right side. And so when Ehud goes to pay the taxes, he actually tells King Eglon, I got a secret message for you, which uh, basically was a dagger to the stomach. And the Bible tells us that Ehud stabbed him so hard that the blade and the handle both went in. And his fat covered all of it. I mean, that's gross. And then Ehud just left like nothing had happened. He like walked out, closed the doors, and uh, everyone thought he was just in the bathroom. But nope, he was dead. So number one on this list, King Eglon. Number two on this list is Sisera. And he comes in the very, very next chapter of Judges, Judges chapter 4. And this is during the time of Deborah. And so right after Ehud, Israel basically went and followed other gods and ended up in some next kingdom's oppression. And so now they're under the Canaanite king Jabin and his commander Sisera. And so this goes on for 20 years. They've just been oppressing them for 20 years. And finally Barak, not Obama, is told that he needs to go attack. And he says, you know what, Deborah, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. And she actually tells them that because you would not go on your own, this victory is not going to be on you. It's going to be in the hands of a woman. And it was. So eventually during the battle, Sisera is fighting and Sisera is losing. And so he runs away to the house of a man named Heber. And Heber was a Kenite and apparently there was some peace between the two of them. And he goes to their house and his wife is home, Jael. And so, you know, being on peaceful terms, he says, I kind of need a drink and I need a nap, right? He asked her for water and a place to lie his head. And so she gives him some milk and she gives him a permanent nap because as he's lying down, she takes a tent peg and she drives it right through his temple. And the Bible says it goes through his temple and all the way into the ground. And as Barak is walking by, she's like, hey, let me show you the man that you were looking for. And so that was the end of Sisera and the end of the Canaanite oppression because his king fell right after him. Number two. Moving on, we get to number three on this list, and that is Abimelech. Still in the book of Judges, um, Abimelech is the son of Gideon, and he's the son of Gideon with a concubine. So he's the outcast among his 70 brothers. Gideon was really popular after that whole 300 moment. And uh, so Abimelech... Realizing that he's not accepted by his multitude of siblings, he actually goes to his mother's people in the town of Shechem and uh, convinces them that he should be their ruler. And so they give him some money, he goes and hires some questionable people, and then they proceed to murder almost all of his brothers. Literally the only one that survives is the youngest brother, Jotham. And so after this, Abimelech is basically last man standing. And they crown him king, which, fun fact, technically makes him the first king of Israel, even before Saul. Now, Abimelech was not a good king. And that's probably best exemplified when you look at his uh, battle at Shechem. And so he's fighting all the people at the Tower of Shechem. And all of those people at the tower decide that they are going to seek refuge in the temple. And they think they're safe. But Abimelech is evil. And so he takes a bunch of trees, cuts them down, and he lights the entire temple on fire, killing what the Bible says about a thousand men, women, and children. Like, this guy was horrible. His downfall, though, came at another tower, 
This time, he's in the town of Thebes. Thebes? Thebes? I, I don't know. He's in another town. And basically, he is fighting again. And the same thing happens. They all decide to run to the tower. And so he's like, oh, I've seen this before. And he gets ready to burn it down. The difference, though, is that there is a smart woman on the tower. And she takes a millstone and just drops it out the window. And it goes right down and hits a beam like right on the head and crushes his skull. And so it's like kind of like Isaac Newton with the apple, except Sir Isaac Newton discovered gravity and Abimelech discovered that he was dying. But that's actually not how he died. Because as soon as that happened, he called for his armor bearer and he said, listen, I need you to stab me because I don't want men to say that a woman killed me. Arrogant to the very end, Abimelech. But moving on, we now get to number four, and that is Asahel. 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 This. So, real quick, we're now leaving the book of Judges into the book of 2 Samuel. Saul is dead. A little bit of a civil war between David and Saul's son, Ishbosheth. And Asahel is on David's side, and he's chasing after Abner, who's on Ishbosheth's side. And the Bible says that Asahel was as fleet of foot as a wild gazelle, which is coincidentally also what many people say about me. No one says that about you. And so Abner is being chased and Abner keeps telling him, stop chasing me. And long story short, Abner ends up hitting him with the blunt end of the spear, not the pointy side, the blunt end of the spear so hard that it goes out through his back. And it says that Asahel died there, proving that he was only quick in a straight line. But moving on, number five is Absalom. And Absalom was the son of David, and he was hot. The Bible actually says that no one was complimented on his good looks as much as Absalom. And he also had amazing hair, which uh, must be nice. But he was so popular that actually after some family drama, he started a revolt and he was trying to take the throne from his dad. And so we know that Solomon is the one who succeeded David. So what happened to Absalom? Well, all that fancy hair was his downfall. And so Absalom started to lose, right? Like a lot of these people in these videos. And he started to lose and he is riding his horse and he's running away because this is how you ride horses. And uh, all that flowy hair actually gets caught in tree branches as he's riding under this great terebinth tree and he's actually pulled off of his horse and he's just dangling there and he's hanging out there for a while because the bible says that there was a guy who saw him and actually ran and told joab hey absalom's over there in that tree and so joab came over and he ended the rebellion basically taking three spears clumping them together and just bam right through absalom's chest which is the exact opposite of uh, don't hurt him, which was what the instructions were. But either way, that's how the hot prince of Israel met his end. Number six is Haman. And so now we're going way into the future. We're now in the book of Esther. And David and Absalom, those are all a faint memory. And so we're living in the time of the Persian Empire. For you prophecy buffs out there, that's the chest of silver. And we are in the reign of King Ahasuerus which you might know better as King Xerxes. Yes, that Xerxes. So we're living in a time where a less baby-oiled version of the guy from 300 is running the world, and Haman is his number two. And so Haman has a problem, though. Haman hates the Jews, and he hates the Jews because of a specific Jew named Mordecai. And Mordecai is a guy that just, he doesn't seem to worship Haman like everybody else, and because of that, Haman wants to wipe out an entire people group which he actually convinces Xerxes to do. And so this guy is basically Hitler. But it doesn't work out the way he thought because he doesn't realize that Mordecai is the cousin of Hadassah. And Hadassah now goes by the name Esther. And Esther just happens to be the new queen of the Persian Empire. So when she finds out about it, she invites Haman and the king to a couple dinners. And at the last dinner basically says, Hey, uh, husband, this man is trying to kill me and all my people. 
the king does not take that very well. And he actually just leaves. And so Haman is sitting there like just groveling to Esther, which makes it look even worse when the king comes back because now Haman is on the same couch as her. And so how does Haman die? Ironically, the king finds out that Haman had been building a 75-foot gallows or tower to hang Mordecai on. So the king thought that's a great idea. And he hung Haman on it and then gave Mordecai his job. And so uh, Haman met his end on his own gallows. Number six, Haman. Number seven on this list, and the final one on this list, is the trifling Median princes. And so we're moving into the book of Daniel, which shows up in the Bible after, but the story actually happens before Esther. And we're in the time of Darius the Mede. And Darius the Mede is running the world and he has three governors, which he puts over 120 satraps or princes or officials, right? So that's why you kind of hear those words used interchangeably. And one of those three governors is Daniel, right? And Daniel is special because he served under Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonian Empire. And now he's right back at the top of a brand new empire. And so they are a little jealous of him. Okay, they're a lot jealous of him. They're trying to kill him. But Daniel's not a corrupt politician. There's no blackmail. There's no kind of dirty laundry that they can air. So the only thing they can do is attack his piety and the fact that he worships God. And so they go in to uh, Darius and they're just basically buttering him up, right? To the point where they're like, you know what? You're the only person that we should be worshiping. And the king is like, you're exactly right. And they set up a decree. And uh, for 30 days, no one is allowed to worship anything except the king. Now, this is problematic for Daniel because he doesn't worship the king. But when he hears about it, he's like, okay. And he goes right back to his window and he prays to God. And these guys are waiting. They're like, gotcha. And they run to the king and they're like, you know, we saw Daniel and he was praying and it wasn't to you and you've got to kill him. All right? And Darius is, is heartbroken because he doesn't want to kill Daniel. But they also remind him that the laws of the Medes and Persians, for some reason, can't be changed. Like, you can't cancel a law or revoke a law. So, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den. And he has a pretty chill night um, and comes out the next morning. And Darius is super happy, right? And he is just so overjoyed, but at the same time, he is so pissed. And so, as Daniel is coming out, he takes those same princes and he throws them into the lion's den and they weren't as uh, blessed as Daniel was because the Bible says that it tore their bones to pieces before they even reached the bottom of the den. So just like Haman, they got a taste of their own medicine. So there you have it, seven times where people died the way they were not expecting to. And so if you enjoyed this, like always, share it with your friends, tell somebody about it. And if you uh, don't like it, then, then cool. But uh, if you're looking for more content, then I encourage you to look up Sevi Sit Down. I'm trying to share some accounts that have some relevant information for you, and Sevi Sit Down is one of those. This account is run by the beautiful Mr. Jed Fritz Frias, and uh, it focuses on interviews uh, with various Christians about their ministries, about their beliefs, uh, and about a lot of pressing topics. And so if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you know, hit them up. They're on all the major ones, you know, Instagram, YouTube, Spotify. And so you can find them there and continue tuning in as I attempt to make more uh, of these videos and more other stuff that hopefully is also cool. All right. Bye.